So I'm Nate Angel, um, and uh, this is a MyFest 22, uh, MyFest 2022, we should say, I guess, for people who people were asking what the number meant. I was like, it's the year. Uh, and we're in the Open Learning Journey Track, which is the a, a program we have in June focused on open learning. And this is this week, week two of the Open Learning Journey is... Um, uh, focused on open learning tools. And so we had a kickoff session earlier in the week where we talked about things globally. And then we've been having these, what we're calling hands on open learning tools sessions throughout where we're um, focused on particular open learning tools. And today it is my great honor to welcome LibreText and Delmar Larson to, uh, to my fest to talk about LibreText. Uh, and he has a whole bunch of stuff to talk about <laughs> um, with LibreText uh, to introduce it to everyone. And I'll say again, um, we'll be We'll be putting the link into chat over and over again for new people who've come uh, to go ahead and sign up for a free LibreText account uh, if you want, if you don't have one already, so that you can kind of follow along with uh, what's going on today. And to kick things off, I thought I might ask um, Delmar, so, you know, all of us are kind of, you know, involved in open education one way or another. How did you get involved in, in open education and end up uh, working on LibreText? Thank you, Nick. Uh, That's a short question and a long answer. Uh, and I'll give you an exceedingly short version of that answer. Uh, I grew up exceedingly poor. Uh, in, in fact, part of my um, uh, childhood, uh, I lived in the back of a truck, in the back of a Denny's. Uh, and um, not actually in the Denny's, but in the truck that didn't behind it. And um, uh, what really got me out of poverty uh, was education and more specifically affordable education uh, and being able to go to public institutions and move on and such like that. So when I became a professor, I'm a professor of chemistry at the University of California, Davis, um, I, <clears throat> I was on the other side. And so I had the opportunity in order to <clears throat> either decide to be part of the problem, um, that is to continue uh, the status quo, the traditional approach um, uh, that uh, resulted in uh, increasingly higher uh, costs for students in order to get their education uh, uh, or be part of the solution. Uh, and uh, open is part of the solution. And that essentially got me uh, into building what is now the LibreTex project uh, over 14 years ago. So we're one of the more older projects that are available uh, today. So, uh, and of course, I can keep on talking more, but no one yeah. Get that stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, that's I mean, I think so many of us did get involved in in open education for very personal reasons sometimes, right? Like um, wanting to be wanting to extend the same kind of opportunities that we receive to others, right? Or to more people even. Well, that's really great. So <clears throat> um, uh, to, to understand a little bit where you're coming from, Delmar, and I'm wondering, um, so uh, about how long has LibreTex been around? And uh, I think you've been there since the very start, right? <laughs> yeah, so I'm, the, I'm, maybe. I'm, the, I'm the founder, director of the project. Uh, uh, it started uh, February of uh, 2008 um, as a wiki. It was actually using the wiki in the Sakai instance, which was a um, uh, the learning management system on my campus at the time, which I would say was probably the mo not the most developed uh, a wiki technology and that's available. Uh, <coughs> And I and they probably have improved it in the last 14 years. <coughs> um, uh, so we started it uh, as a uh, following, I would say, the craze of the time, which is wikis. Uh, Wikipedia came on the scenes. People are starting to look at that. Uh, and the idea is, well, let's make a crowdsourced approach. Uh, so uh, I wanted to address uh, educational needs in my class, lowering the cost, that is. And uh, either I could get money in order to be able to do that, uh, or I can use students. Uh, and being at a large R1 institution, where sometimes some of my classes would be about 500 students, I had a massive market of sorts in order to be able to build content. So we started an open pedagogical approach. Uh, in fact, we've that same approach we've been using for the last 14 years, uh, but has been uh, dwarfed by other mechanisms that we've built uh, our repository. Um, but students continue to write, edit, uh, move things forward in a, um, <clears throat> in a variety of different uh, uh, models, depending upon the nature of the class, in order to generate uh, material. Um, That's interesting. So the, the root of LibreText really is an open educational practice. Yeah, it, it definitely. And it, it still is. You know, we, we've had probably somewhere in the order of five to 7,000 students that have contributed to our um, 
a project as part of classes. Um, and then I have a standing army of about 100 undergraduate students that are working outside of their classes. Uh, so while it's not pedagogical uh, in their education, they get exposed to um, uh, the content uh, that they then uh, massage and work through uh, on our system. Uh, so we're very student heavy. We just don't really emphasize that aspect uh, in um, our interactions with the, the community. That's great. Well, I know that you have a lot of stuff that you want to show us today, so uh, I want to let you get started with that. Um, just a reminder to folks, um, we all have the ability to turn on our cameras and our mics here, but if you could um, stay muted when you're not actually talking, that would be great. Um, we'll have a lot of opportunities for interaction, um, so it's not to keep people <laughs> not to keep people from talking, but just so that for the recording's purposes, we'll make sure to capture what, what Delmar is showing. Thanks. All right. Well, yeah, let's take us on the journey that you have plans. Great. Okay. Uh, I'm hoping you'll be able to follow the chat uh, and can. Oh, yeah. Step. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, let me take the screen, which should be viewable, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, this is somewhat of a um, sing along uh, uh, approach here. Uh, so, I encourage you to get a free account uh, and you can get it at commons.libretext.org. Uh, I want to give a little bit of an overview of what the LibreText project is, uh, a little bit of an overview of the Commons Conductor platform, which is the specific uh, feature of the LibreText project uh, that I'm discussing. Um, and uh, then I'm going to be going into the actual uh, website, uh, the commons.libretext.org, and start to go through the various features that we've developed there and why we've gone about doing that. So uh, let's get this thing started. Uh, and I like to start uh, with uh, our mission statement. Um, now, we actually have a formal mission statement that took like a month uh, and a committee in order to be able to draft their 21 words in order to be able to res uh, write in order to um, share that mission statement, uh, but I never use it. Uh, this is the what I like to give out here, which I, I, I at least internally refer to as the three C's, the key aspects that emphasize what the LibreText project is. So we're implementing a community-built platform for the construction, curation, and adoption, adaption. So those are the, through the, the four components that I think are important for a successful OER project. Of OER, uh, Open Educational Resources, that's comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels. Um, so the there we go. Um, so the community means anyone and everyone that has an interest in order to be able to, uh, uh, in OER, in order to contribute to that. Uh, <coughs> OER, we can debate for a long time about what exactly OER represents. For the sake of this conversation, I just say free or freely available. Uh, and if you want to debate on what exactly constitutes OER, we can do so afterwards. Uh, comprehensive, <coughs> that means that we follow a no gap left behind policy. So while the LibreText project, which is a successor to an earlier project, as I mentioned before, which is a wiki based approach called the chem wiki, um, it's expanded far beyond chemistry. Uh, in fact, basically, uh, there is no topic that we're uninterested in order to be able to address. Now, that being said, chemistry is the most mature of the fields that we uh, work on. Uh, so it's the one that's responsible for 70 75% of our traffic, although the other fields and the content uh, stored in those other libraries that we have uh, have been growing quite uh, steadily over the years. We I also suppose follow that reflects in... your, your background in chemistry, personally, right? Oh, I mean, I, I guess you could consider the hexagons as benzene rings. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. uh, um, I, I will mention, if you do know chemistry, I am a physical chemist, which many chemists would consider to be more of a physicist that's not afraid of chemicals. Um, but nonetheless, um, so we follow a no gap left behind policy. Um, so we have an interest across the board horizontally, <coughs> that interest also extends vertically. So we're interested in K-12 uh, education, we're interested in graduate uh, education. The nice thing of being, about being at a R1 uh, institution is that there's interest across the board uh, um, in all these things, whether it's a school of education for the K-12 or in graduate uh, studies, which we or graduate level education, which is what we do naturally. We also follow a no tech left behind policy. And it's basically part of the greater scheme of the way we use uh, open, which is essentially a more sharing is caring approach. So when technology has been generated and it's been uh, freely available, we go through efforts in order to integrate it into our platform so that the community can actually use it effectively without having to go through the pains of being able to learn how to use that. Because sometimes it can actually be quite uh, difficult in order to be able to use use technology that's out there for a variety of reasons. Uh, <clears throat> and lastly, 
Oh, those arrows are not going to the right spots. Uh, uh, it's curated. Um, so the, the central aspect behind the, the libraries uh, that underlies our, our technology uh, is a wiki-based approach. And we chose wikis because wikis uh, are the best technology for a collaborative, large-scale construction effort. Uh, and you can think of Wikipedia as approach in order to be able to do that. Uh, more importantly, it provides an epi a mechanism in order to facilitate a living library, a resource that constantly is updated and is able to be updated, and more importantly, has the people behind it that facilitate the adoptions in order to be able to do that. The opposite of a living library would be a dead library, and that would be an example of um, a pile of PDFs, which are probably one of the worst mechanisms in order to store content, although they're quite convenient for transferring content from one spot to another spot. <coughs> so these are the three C's that uh, define how we actually operate uh, and such. So um, let me get rid of this little thing, doesn't matter. Okay, so the Libre Text project has a lot of facets for a variety of different reasons. Um, we are not wedded to a specific technology. Um, so we actually have a range of different technologies that represents what we refer to as the Libreverse, which I'll show to you in the next slide. Now, so the I mentioned this wikis, which is the technology underlying the libraries, which we've modified at various uh, stages. We have other technologies in order to provide ancillary components around there, like our homework system, which is a topic for a different presentation, um, the Commons and Conductor, which is what we'll be discussing here, and a handful of other things that are out there. So the Libertex project has three primary facets. Now, it, it can be used as a construction platform. Uh, and, and I want to emphasize that it's not just a construction platform of OER. It's a construction platform for what I refer to as the textbook of the future. Now, the implementation of advanced uh, capabilities in a textbook in order to be able to move beyond a traditional text image based approach. Now, I don't know what the textbook of the future looks like because it's the future, but I'm pretty sure that it involves technology and you'll be able to move it forward. <coughs> Um, so within that scape, uh, within the greater Libreverse, I'd say we're the most powerful um, construction platform out there for building these sort of things. Uh, and Libretext is a powerful dissemination platform. In fact, it's the, uh, the largest OER repository that's centralized that people can grab from um, and propagate. Uh, we distribute somewhere in the order of, at least during the school year, 700 to 800,000 pages a day. Uh, and we deliver about 850 million pages uh, over the 14 years of our time. We're looking forward to our one billionth page served uh, uh, sometime this winter. Um, and we'll probably have a little McDonald's symbol in order to represent uh, that's out there. But nonetheless, having things centralized provides a, an effective mechanism in order to distribute the, the platform. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that we've been pursuing this thing. It also provides additional benefits in terms of building resources because things are centralized and standardized. Um, and that can be exceedingly important when you're trying to copy, for example, from PDFs, as most people remember, know when you copy from a PDF, it doesn't work quite so well. <coughs> <clears throat> These two are for the author and for the user, uh, for the instructor or adopter. Um, Libretex is also a learning platform, which is intrinsic to the fact that, again, I am an instructor. Um, and so not only do I wear a hat in terms of building an OER platform um, or an OER or facilitating uh, an OER project on my campus, but also um, I build and I use OER in the classroom. Uh, and wearing different hats provides um, various pushes in terms of how we operate. But the key point is that we want to be able to build a mechanism in order to facilitate and that has a ver variety of different aspects other than just being able to share it. Uh, learning analytics is one of the key points that's uh, on there. And we'll be releasing a lot more information regarding the learning analytics infrastructure that comes in when people host uh, or use Libretex projects, uh, books on our Libretex. We're actually quite powerful, uh, quite excited about the power that's behind that. <clears throat> hey, if okay. you need to grab a glass of water too. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I, I have some that's residual right. COVID. Uh, um, oh, I'm so sorry about so. that. We're all dealing with that that reality, yeah, right? It's getting around. Okay, so I mentioned the Libreverse. Um, so the Libretex is the name. There isn't a single platform, um, and there's some benefits associated with not being stuck with a single platform. The key point is that no single platform has the full range of capabilities to handle everything that you want it to, uh, to do. Uh, so being able to have a range of different technologies in order to be able to be tied together and move things forward gives us the freedom and the power in order to be able to build these textbooks of the future. So this is the Libreverse. Uh, and the core of the Libreverse consists of 15. Now we have 15 because we're about, uh, about to release a Ukrainian version of our uh, repository uh, <coughs> of uh, 
pseudo independently operating wikis. Um, they're focusing on different fields like chemistry, physics, biology, geosciences, social sciences. Um, and in some cases, like I mentioned, the Ukrainian and Espanol libraries are the ones focusing on um, uh, Ukrainian and uh, Spanish language uh, OER. Um, and that's actually quite an interesting topic involving machine language and things like that, that again, if people are interested, I could talk about. And then surrounding these wikis, uh, these uh, that constitute the hub, uh, are these ancillary technologies I mentioned. Uh, we have a homework system called Adapt that we've been working on aggressively over the last couple of years. Uh, uh, we have a project Solo, which is a standalone uh, technology that you can use in order to host uh, content if you want to have your own uh, stuff stored around. You can think of it something similar to being able to host your own stuff on Pressbooks. Uh, we have a Jupyter Notebook system for embeddable XLQ code. We have several servers that host uh, lots of JavaScript technologies out there. Learning analytics, I mentioned, uh, uh, and we'll be releasing it soon to give uh, authors and instructors detailed information on how students are using their books. And that provides useful feedback in terms of how um, in both the pedagogy of how you use the book and the efficacy of the book that's out there. So 99.9% .9 of all books, whether they're OER or non-OER, uh, don't have uh, efficacy uh, behind the learning experience in terms of demonstrating that they really do what they do, whether they do what they do in an optimal manner. We're able to provide that feedback um, this summer. Uh, <clears throat> we have a bot server that's important for being able to curate the content that's out there and the commons and conductor, which is the topic of this conversation. And we have a forum in order to facilitate uh, communication, whether it's uh, amongst the curation team in order to, again, push the curation aspect, uh, or it's amongst authors that are looking for feedback or communication that's out there. <coughs> so of all these circles here, it's the commons and conductor that is the topic of uh, this presentation. So, excuse me. No problem. Take all the time you need. There's a lot okay. of information here, so it gives time people time to reflect. Yeah, I, I should probably chill out a little bit. I, sometimes I go a little fast. Um, okay, so uh, I, I want to focus a little bit more about um, how we address things before jumping into the Commons and Conductor system, and so. The OER universe is heavily fragmented and it's getting more and more fragmented in some cases and more and more consolidated in other cases that's out there. So you could find content, or actually more specifically, you could find links to content in the open textbook library, which is more of a referatory than a library. OER Common, which is also mostly a referatory, although it has uh, editing capabilities out there. Uh, OpenStax, Merlot, Open SUNY, Galileo, you could find content, uh, Open Oregon, Nova, BC Campus, eCampus Ontario, Alberta, Hawaii, Sailor, uh, CSUs, and I could keep on going for an exceedingly long time. Now, some of them are connected here. Uh, since I made this slide about three years ago, I should also have included the Pressbooks catalog, uh, which uh, connects um, many of the Pressbooks instances together. Um, the key point is things are distributed in a variety of different spots. Now, now uh, some people consider this to be uh, the ideal situation, the people who tend to think more around the anarchy-based approach of, of, of things. However, um, this makes curation exceedingly difficult. For example, if you have three people who've adopted the same book uh, for their classes and they've improved three different versions of that book, okay, then a new person that comes in <clears throat> because they're fragmented and they're stored in different spots, it makes it exceedingly difficult for a new person to come in to benefit from what other people are doing. And benefiting from what other people are doing is one of the defining aspects of OER, of being open. Uh, uh, and by having things horrifically fragmented, uh, whether they're the same technology on multiple instances, multiple campuses, or across multiple technologies, whether they're stored in one format or another for it, really, uh, in, in my opinion, is a serious issue in terms of moving OER forward. So there are different approaches in order to be able to address this. One is to implement a standard across the board for everyone to be able to use, um, and that's a, a near impossible in order to be able to implement for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> the other way in order to do that, and this is the way that we decided to go about doing it, is to consolidate. Take as much OER as we can take uh, and bring it into our wiki-based technology. And we call that harvesting, which is the term in order to mean that not only do we bring things in and store it, we go through the effort in order to standardize it um, in order to make the, the underlying code the same uh, and make it easier in order to be able to remix and copy and use things productively, especially when you start to add some value to technology onto it. 
Um, forgot um, Oregon State off of here. So what we're doing uh, in the corpus, the content that, uh, that's in our libraries, which numbers somewhere in the order of now about 500,000 pages of OER content, is that we're building a bigger bucket of Legos. And each Lego, again, is standardized, so, so you or each piece that is, so when an, someone wants to build a book, uh, they don't want to build it from scratch. That's the whole point of remixing or at least building collections. You want to be able to take these things and combine the pieces together conveniently and more importantly, do it without pain. Because if you were, uh, in this case here, a child building a, a project instead of a, a instead of a, an instructor building a, a new book and you happen to have three different boxes ones in duplos uh, ones in lego uh, ones in legos and the other ones in lincoln logs it, you don't have the resources they don't intermix very well although i know duplo and legos can mix a little bit but let's ignore that aspect uh, and that's part of the issue that's associated so when you build these things to standardize them you make this massive repository that makes it easier in order to remix and anything that makes it easier to remix lowers the barrier for instructors in order to get into the oer field is a big thing it's the key aspect that i think is stopping uh, oer moving forward is buy-in uh, because the difficulty and the, uh, of time and money in order to be able to do that. So we go through this effort so that people don't have to. Uh, and we bring in stuff from whether it's LaTeX or it's press books or, or uh, it's, uh, it's any uh, website that has no aspect, no things off of it, PDFs. <coughs> I have a team of 100 undergraduate students that are just ripping apart these pages, standardizing and bringing them back together again with appropriate attributions and such in order to be able to make it work. So in other words, we're taking OER and we're capitalizing on the O and really scaling it up in order to make the, the biggest central repository of OER content out there. And that's the reason why we get the traffic that's there because we go through this effort. And that's for the community, but it also provides a mechanism for uh, the people who use the LibreText project directly for doing things. Hey, Delmar, um, yes. kind of on that note, uh, kind of question came up in chat. So you partially answered it there. People are wondering like, who does all this work? And so obviously there's a team of um, students working on it. There must be some, also some other technical folks working on it. Um, and people are interested in knowing who works on it, but also um, how it's all paid for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything comes down to sustainability and money. Um, uh, so <clears throat> uh, we are not a for-profit company, uh, which means that we don't charge lots of money for what we're doing. We don't charge any money. So any, um, within reason. So any instructor can come in and build their book and get full access to the capabilities that we have. That's the export features or any of the things. We don't hobble capabilities of these sort of things. We, we've had several grants um, that we've gotten from several different sources. We've gotten funding from the federal and, and the California um, uh, uh, government, um, National Science Found Foundation. Uh, we were the recipient of the inaugural open textbook pilot uh, uh, Department of Education, U.S. Department of Education uh, grant, which gave us a sizable amount of money in order to be able to scale up what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> uh, the ADAPT homework system was uh, funded by the California Education Learning Lab. Uh, we have another NSF proposal going out uh, very soon. We're looking forward to uh, hopefully, with fingers crossed, getting a sizable amount of investment from the state for scaling up a learning lab and a handful of other uh, bits and pieces here and there in our video. We have a not-for-profit uh, uh, company that, that's outside of my campus uh, that provides us the flexibility in order to pursue um, uh, sustainability models that are difficult in order to do within campuses. Um, and that involves uh, our consortium. So we have a consortium uh, of campuses that uh, can buy in um, uh, for only $1,000 a, a year, which is about one tenth of what you would get from other uh, platforms with, with, I think, reduced capabilities. And we do that because I have a day job. I don't need to pay myself salary, things like that, which is convenient uh, uh, off of it. So in other words, we're subsidized by my university in order to do this stuff for you. And because we use students, uh, the return on investment is enormous compared to actually paying for well-trained professional people like Nate, because um, I can't afford Nate <laughs> uh, or so. Um, so if I got 
30 undergraduate students, I can approximate Nate uh, in order to be able to do the sort of things. Down. Maybe 40. Students, probably but, exceed, yeah. probably exceed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so that's the way that we operate. And, and so we're taking advantage of what I have as a faculty member at R1 institution or MOOC. And then also as pedagogy. So I assume it's also a learning experience for the students, right? It's not just a job for them. Right. Uh, and so they put it on their resume, they learn capabilities, the people who get involved so that we have different roles. So we have harvesters that do what I was mentioned before. We have remixers uh, that will help faculty in order to remix content. So the faculty organize what they want their book to say, and they give it off as a menu to another person, a student that then builds the book for them. Um, then we have uh, curators that go in and update various things, and we also have the tech team. And the tech team goes in and they go through big things or small things. In fact, the Commons and Conductor system was designed by uh, a student uh, on uh, on my campus, and he just showed up to me and said, "I built this for you." And I'm like, "Oh, wow, that's actually really good." Uh, so uh, that, that's really quite a beautiful situation uh, to to be in um, off of here. And if we were outside of an academic environment, uh, we would never be able to operate like this. Uh, we would need more revenue and we would be near, not nearly as productive that's out there. And that really goes back to your, I mean, it, it's the roots of this are an open education experience, right? It's like the students are involved at all levels, not just as consumers, but as, as constructors. Definitely. Definitely. And, and, and they should be. Uh, now, I, they're not necessarily at this. If you use them properly, they work well. If you try to use them uh, improperly, it can be an exceedingly painful experience uh, in terms of writing and things like that. So you have to be very guided in the way you're doing. So one of the things that we have planned uh, as far as this proposal I mentioned before is to build an open pedagogical tool that's based on the common and conductor in order to facilitate using students effectively uh, in the classroom in order to be able to do open pedagogy, whether that happens to be constructing content or constructing, whether that content happens to be textbooks or happens to be questions for a homework system or solving the systems or solutions or a wide range of other things that students are great in order to be able to do. Like for example, along that topic and then I can transition back into the presentation. Um, and I, I can bring it up in the Commons Conductor because we use this technology in order to manage these hundreds of undergraduate students because I can't do that uh, in traditional ways. Um, and so I have about uh, 15 to 18 students that forms a sub team. And what they're doing is they're going through all of the OpenStax questions and building solutions. Uh, for them. Uh, and uh, because OpenStax doesn't give the solutions out or they're, they're not openly licensed, so we can't uh, uh, use them effectively um, unless we pay a marketing thing or something with them. But anyways, uh, we build them and then we can build them bigger and better with more uh, a, a more powerful tutorial based approach of it. So I have this team that's just going through and plowing through them. They can then take that stuff and they write them on their resumes. So I write multiple letters of support for them as they move on to the next step of their career that they have contributed to that. Or sometimes they actually then continue to contribute uh, um, uh, long after they graduated. So. <clears throat> okay, did I answer all the questions or should I move on? I think, I think uh, now they're just trying to figure out how many undergrads it would take to equal Nate. And I think it's just one actually, but anyway, go, go for it. <laughs> okay, um, so again, uh, by, uh, so the corpus is built uh, uh, by uh, open pedagogy, by having students contribute to it uh, uh, in a variety, multiple steps way, because it's not typically a single, they're not subject matter experts. So you have to use an aggregate based approach. Um, and then we also capitalize on in, uh, integrating existing OER material into our platform. Uh, so it provides a centralized approach for doing things. Uh, it provides a standardized approach in order to do things. We, we build it so they're interconvertible. Uh, um, we can build collections uh, so that you can say, well, here's a collection of OpenStack problems, uh, or here's a collection of Lumen learning problems, which we are building right now, uh, even though we've gotten it for a variety of different reasons, actually for one reason, but whatever. Uh, uh, <clears throat> it provides a mechanism in order to be flexible uh, off of here, so it's not a rigid platform, and more importantly, it provides a mechanism to be curatable. Uh, and because my team facilitates the curation, we move it forward because the book doesn't stop at publishing. Uh, at least we don't believe it, it should stop at publishing. It, it needs to continually be moving forward because while I like to say that OER is super great and it is, uh, not all the content that's created out there is really at the level of a traditional textbook that's, that's down there. Until we get that content at the traditional textbook level, we're not going to be able to, to have the high impact that we want to have 
down there. And it's just reality check uh, to be down there. And I know that some people may debate with me on that, but they're wrong. So anyways, uh, <clears throat> um, I will also mention there are utilities in terms of standardizing things beyond just being able to find content. Uh, one aspect that we have that we found, uh, we started getting um, recently uh, are people who uh, want to use our corpus as a mechanism in order to train uh, AI or artificial intelligence because things are standardized, centralized, easy in order to tap into uh, with meta tags and, uh, and uh, uh, various aspects uh, that, that you get from standardization. It's a uh, cornucopia for being able to train uh, uh, AIs out there. And we have uh, multiple projects out there in order to train whether it has to do with uh, workforce for knowledge, skills, and abilities, um, uh, or, or it happens to be with being able to train a bot that's able to, or train an AI infrastructure in order to help guide evaluating open-ended questions. Uh, so that your homework system <coughs> could be a bit more powerful uh, than just basically um, uh, more traditional auto graded capabilities and such that. And I and I, I have no doubt that things are going to get better off of here and keeping things centralized and now is to be able to do that. So. Um, I'm taking a little bit of a slower response here because we have a bit more time. Uh, if we do get time uh, after I go over the commons and conductor, I can uh, talk about uh, how you actually edit. Um, the editor infrastructure on the pages of our wikis uh, is a CK editor, which is the most popular public or open source editor out there. Um, and it gives us the ability in order to essentially edit just like it would be in a Word document. We have some additional value added components that we put onto it in order to uh, make something more powerful in order to build the textbook of the future. But the key aspect that I emphasize is if you can edit on your learning management system or if you can edit on a Google Doc, you can edit on our platform. Uh, it's just the issues that comes in is if you want to really start doing advanced stuff, well, then you have to start dealing with complexity because you can't have complexity let me phrase that. You can't have power without some level of complexity. We try to hide it, but we're not always very good at that. So anyways, um, <clears throat> I mentioned the textbook of the future multiple times. This is an example of my quantum mechanics, uh, uh, a page from my quantum mechanics class. Um, so we have this Jupyter notebook system that gives us the ability to embed executable code into our platform. The, the, it's native to the Libre uh, text infrastructure. So we have power off of it. So it's not some external system that we bring in. And then we can uh, build this case. In this case here, if you're familiar with particle in the box quantum mechanics, which I'm sure everyone here uh, is quite comfortable with, this provides an opportunity for students to engage with Python code and then see the actual uh, content out there. Because in the STEM fields, and especially in the physical STEM fields, uh, it, being exposed to coding is exceedingly important in our educational system. So this is, again, one of the aspects of building the textbook of the future, augmenting this. And we have lots of other examples of various uh, interactive components that you can embed and, uh, and make uh, this thing. Because there's lots of evidence out there. The more interactive your textbook is, the greater the learning experience is for your students who use that textbook out there. Um, um, this is a, 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 a general platform, and I really should drop this page, but this is important in order to emphasize how we uh, go about doing these things. Um, so the development team uh, builds an, uh, uh, content uh, in the repository from you know, various sources. They edit and typeset to essential standard. We also cross-reference and meta tag uh, to a, a variety of frameworks where the learning objectives or the keyword frameworks provides effective mechanisms in order to be able to do searches across the entire platform instead of individual small fragmented fragments, uh, which is what we have right now. And in order to facilitate that, and this is important for building books, uh, is that we built uh, what we call the OER remixer, or the remixer in short. And the remixer is a tool that allows people to come in and graphically say, I like this page, I'm going to put it here in my book. And I like this page, I'm going to put it here in your book. And it does it uh, um, in a, in a, uh, across the whole corpus. And you can build and remix your book very effectively, very quickly, uh, uh, and without having to go through the barriers that uh, you can oftentimes get for copying and pasting. And it does things like auto number uh, the, the pages uh, <coughs> uh, and provides a mechanism um, in order to 
ad tagging and stuff like that. It's, it's a pretty powerful tool. We're quite excited about that. We're going to be releasing version 3.0 this summer, uh, which we're going to have a few additional features and we're going to streamline things off of here. This is what it looks like right now. Um, and if there's interest, we can uh, go over it again uh, after my, my presentation is out there, where you can basically come in and drag pages over here and you can delete them and they will auto number. And the nice thing is if you do things properly, when you change the title number, it will then change the figure numbers, the equation numbers, and the type numbers off of there. The key point is to reduce the barrier of remixing to as low as possible so that faculty adopters or faculty builders don't have to invest much time in order to be able to do that. Um, okay, so I'm about near the end of this overall introduction so we can actually get to the, the gist here before Nate starts to throw virtual books my way. <coughs> um, the Commons and Conductor is sort of a clunky name. Um, and it has two aspects. It has the commons and it has the conductor. So the commons uh, is our front end catalog. Now, so um, it's a public facing and it provides a mechanism in order to do searches across all our libraries um, and of the content that we store in our libraries. So that means it'll be either books, it provides the opportunity in order to pursue the libraries. And I'll show you this momentarily. And of course, if you're on the internet, which you are right now, you can go to commons.libertix.org and take a look at this in real life, but I'll be showing that in a moment. Um, we could build collections uh, and we uh, it provides a catalog in order to showcase homework. Uh, so homework also is uh, would constitute collections. So you can say, okay, here are the homeworks that you have available. You could do a search through those things. The homeworks are part of our adapt infrastructure or our Libra Studio infrastructure. Um, but it, it, you can start to make a connection between what's uh, homework independently and textbooks in, uh, out there. We have a section under development, uh, and that's meant for people who are building resources that they want the community to know that they are building it and they can actually review it. There are two flavors of uh, commons and conductor systems. There's the Libra Commons, which is our central repository or central instance. Uh, which is what this link is down below. And then campuses that are part of this LibreNet consortium I mentioned uh, a few moments ago, uh, will get uh, campus branded versions of that. So you can think of it as essentially their campus uh, front end that they're able to identify uh, and showcase their books to relevant stakeholders, whether they happen to be students or administrators or alumni and things like that. The back end uh, is private facing. You need an account, which again is freely available uh, to anybody. Um, and that's a project building tool. Uh, and it's an exceedingly powerful project uh, building tool, uh, although it's simple in the way it's formulated, uh, but it's, it's built around OER in general. Uh, uh, it gives you the ability in order to set alerts. So if you want to go in and say, I am particularly interested in quantum mechanic books. So when a quantum mechanic books gets added to the corpus, you'll get a notification out there. So it's really convenient if you're really uh, want to know uh, to get feedback on how the corpus grows rather than just doing searches when you want to put out there. <coughs> um, faculty who have content that they want to contribute to our corpus uh, uh, or they request content to be uh, added to it or harvested um, for their uh, editing or remixing needs uses the conductor as a mechanism in order to request that. Um, it also provides a mechanism for facilitating adoption uh, statistics. Um, it facilitates peer reviewing uh, across the book, um, communications uh, across different instances. Um, looks like I have two slides here uh, across different instances of the LibreNet uh, so that you can identify if someone else is building a book uh, on a different campus. So there's no point of reproducing the wheel. Uh, uh, and that's again is the sharing is caring model in order to be able to do these things. Um, and that lets you again see uh, any LibreNet instance that's public uh, project. Projects can be private and then they're uh, private because they're private. So cue the internet. Uh, that's the end of my PowerPoint before I start going into the things. I Got think it. I see some things here in the chat. I'm, I presume. Yeah, there's only there was only one kind of leftover question from that, but you might get into it and what you're going to show us um, from Danielle about how do you structure the learning steps. Uh, noting that students would have to learn programming and separately learn QMEC concepts, which are quite heavy. Um, <clears throat> this is in regards to embedding the uh, executable code into the book. So you have the ability in order to uh, hide the code. Uh, so the, in, in, in the way that we formulate it uh, for our quantum mechanics series, um, so it, which extends over one and a half quarters, um, and then you have other PCAM topics that's out there. So the first term, um, they have access to the code, but all they need to do is just press the button in order to run it. 
Um, and I can I can pull up the link uh, that, that's out there in order to showcase that if that's uh, of, of importance. Um, so they don't need to actually, uh, they just get exposed to the code. It's the second uh, term uh, where they, they're asked, go in and modify this parameter here and this parameter. So the intent is not to teach people Python because that, uh, as Daniel emphasize, <coughs> it starts to take away of teaching quantum mechanics, which is the point of the, the class. But it gives people the ability of just kind of tweaking here and tweaking there in order to be able to do it. It's like a simulator, but it's a simulator that you can come in and you can code up anything you want, and you don't need to worry about building JavaScript or things like that. If you know Python, which is the, now the scientific language uh, choice, um, then you can go about doing that. I'm, an, uh, I'm a MATLAB guy, so I prefer to use Octave when I uh, program these things. But we have R and we have C++, and there are actually 30 different languages that are connected to there. So if you're in computer science, you can run it. If you're in statistics, you can run it. If you're in uh, any um, Python, can extend it over multiple fields out there. So uh, I really like this stuff. You can even run ab initio calculations on it. Uh, very, very simple. Um, and, and we had problems last year, unfortunately, because of its flexibility that people were running uh, cryptocurrency mining. Um, and so we had to go through some efforts in order to be able to block that sort of stuff uh, out there. So hopefully that will die and not be a problem anytime uh, in the future. Okay, so again, the Libra commons. And so uh, I, again, I'll emphasize there are multiple commons and conductor instances. Now, each LibreNet campus has their own branded version of this. This is the primary one, the one that's connected to LibreText that we have off of here. Um, and again, it's designed as a, a front end um, search infrastructure through the books. Um, so right now there's a series of uh, searches. We're tweaking things here and there uh, as we go through that. Uh, <clears throat> and um, you could do a search for uh, calculus, for example, <coughs> and it will bring up the book. Right now, it's doing a search through the central bookshelves. Now, now the, the the content on our libraries. I'm just going to bring this up on the chemistry library, um, and I, I wasn't going to focus on this, but it's important in order to do it. Let me log out so you don't see all the junk that's there. Um, uh, our books are, uh, our content on any library is organized in three different uh, areas. Uh, we have our campus bookshelves, we have our uh, centralized bookshelves, uh, and then we have our learning objects. And the intent that we have here is there are distinct benefits of having a fragmented infrastructure, even though I was dismissive of them uh, a while ago. And the key aspect is the flexibility component, the ability in order to customize your resources and not stick with a canonical version. For example, OpenStax, which is really great, uh, doesn't give you the flexibility to customize it. Their platform is, this is the OpenStax book, and this is the OpenStax book, period. Uh, um, but we, no faculty member I've ever met is 100% happy with their book, except maybe the person who wrote the book. <coughs> Uh, so we have we have a desire to remove content. We have a desire to add content. Uh, so uh, while we store... <coughs> content in our centralized bookshelves are curated by the our curation team um, and they're organized uh, in that way so you can think of these as sort of the canonical books that you can tap into and then people uh, in individual campuses can come in and build their remixes in their individual uh, spots uh, uh, for example um, trying to bring something that's um, not well, whatever, uh, Mountain View College, for example. Uh, so they have built a range of books in order to support their uh, their curriculum uh, that is remixed from other uh, content, mostly from the central repository, but you can remix from other people's books. Again, the sharing is carrying models, centralized, convenient in order to be able to tap into and uh, customize your books. So the key aspect here is that we have the benefits of a centralized infrastructure and the benefits of a decentralized infrastructure coexisting uh, on, on how we operate. The last one I'll mention here is that we have content stored on our learning objects. So these are collections that are not designed around conventional textbooks, but they're designed around other organizations. For example, since we're looking at chemistry, here are laboratory experiments, whether they're dry labs or they're wet labs. You can go through and say, yes, I really want a lab dealing with probabilistic interpretation of atomic orbitals. Who wouldn't want that sort of lab uh, in order to, to do? In this case here, this is a little bit more JavaScript. Actually, you have to load up the JavaScript um, that's there. Uh, 
uh, <clears throat> and other various learning objects that, that people could tap into. Again, each one of these uh, pages is a Lego piece that you can build in order to uh, build your version, your vision. And the bigger the library is, the easier it is for you to build your vision, um, which is really quite beautiful as it starts to build, as it starts to grow into what we're doing. Now, the reason I emphasize that is essentially when we do a search here, we do a search primarily through the central uh, bookshelves, because if you do a search through everything, uh, you'll start to get lots and lots of content. And many of them are remixes that look very similar to other books. Uh, and it's convenient to kind of get rid of things that are just small perturbations and get to uh, the canonical books. But we can go in and say, do, we, do a search through campus bookshelves. <coughs> and then we can see 30. Uh, 30 books that have uh, calculus uh, that's uh, out there. Uh, and many of them, again, are quite similar. Uh, and many of them are based off of OpenStax books, which are really based off of Stang's books, which is a well-developed uh, uh, calculus uh, uh, series out there. So, um, and such. And you can do that on a variety of other sources uh, that, that's out there. And you can do, uh, you know, more um, sophisticated searches off of here. But again, the key point is this is a catalog that you're able to identify. If you do the same thing through a different resource, like let's say I took Los... Uh, uh, Rios uh, Community College. Uh, so they're a consortium member um, and they have 67 um, uh, books in their repository. It's all in our libraries the way we are. This is a mechanism to tie it up and present it in a very convenient manner for their students to be able to tap, uh, capitalize on here. Their books were created not 100% from scratch. They were this approach where their instructors built their um, formulated the organization of their book and what's called course reports and then handed it off to my student team in order to build the books for them um, and that provided a mechanism to build a range let me phrase it a plethora of books for the campus in order to scale up and then once they're constructed you can start to customize them that makes it easier which is again the point uh, of what we want to do what we should all oer is to make things easy and powerful so i digress off of here um, uh, you have access to the libraries, you have access to the collections. These are sort of uh, things that are tied together into various ways, whether you want to look at the OpenStax books or Open SUNY books um, and such. And this has nothing in the uh, uh, Lumen Learning, but it will uh, very soon that you can start to look at the books that are in Lumen Learning that have been uh, shifted to another uh, spot um, and such. So these are sort of partners or people that we, or organizations that we want to tie things together. We have a homework system where you can go through and say, okay, well, I want to look at homework associated with and do searches on Spanish or sociology or various things like that. Uh, in order to be able to access this, you have to then go to the uh, um, to the ADAPT homework system, which is, again, outside of the conversation that we have here. But we're very excited about that. Um, and then we can see, well, what are people building in various sources um, uh, out there? So we have 149 projects that people have been building um, uh, across the, the board. So, um, okay, so that, that's a front end. It's fairly simple, a straightforward approach in order to, to do that. <coughs> um, we use it as a mechanism for uh, requesting in instructor accounts on our libraries because we have a little bit more control over that. Um, uh, so we want to review that and not just give it out freely, although we do give it out freely. We just want to have we want to make sure that everyone who has an instructor account is an instructor. Um, but what's more interesting uh, it, by far is the conductor, the back end. And this is what requires an account in order to be able to tap into. Um, and, and if you click on here, if you have a Google enabled account or a Microsoft enabled account, you can use this single sign on and we will uh, we'll recognize it. I think we'll recognize it. Um, or we can do local authorization. I can play around here in order to remember exactly how that works. Uh, so in this case here, I just signed in or I, I created an account and this is uh, my conductor infrastructure. So <clears throat> the conductor is not designed in order to build a book per se. It's designed in order to organize the building of a book. Now, that may... May, may not appear to be significantly different, but it, it is, especially if you have a team of people out there. So we tried a range of different uh, project organization tools, for example, Trello or Kanban-based approaches and a lot of other things, and we were not overly happy with that. So we needed to have something that was designed for facilitating OER uh, that's out there. So anyone can use this. It's a 
free account, just like I mentioned to you before. And you could do this on any plat. You can use it for building and organizing on any platform. It's true power is coupling in with the Libre text, but if you want to actually build it for a Pressbooks instance, feel free. It's it's a tool for the community in order to, to use. <coughs> um, so anyways, uh, this is my front end. So it, it has a few uh, features that look different from your guys's because I really should have a, a demo account that, that's out there, um, but not significantly different. The key aspect is that we have these recently added projects. And since you probably have a new account, you have no recently added projects. Um, we have some announcements that are on the side here in order to guide people. I will emphasize that uh, next month on the 18th, 20th, and 22nd, uh, we'll be running our Liberfest, uh, which is our presentation slash workshop infrastructure, where you can come in and you learn stuff in one day, and the next day you start to do work, homework, uh, we have office hours to guide you along in order to be able to do this. so if they like what we're talking about and you want to learn more this is a a, a, a powerful mechanism or powerful um uh, platform or meeting in order to be able to to do that uh and we also have lots of things on we have recordings of these things on uh, our youtube channel so you can peruse them if you wanted to see them right now yeah uh, but what is um is more interesting are projects. Um, so projects are projects, that sounds silly. Projects are uh, uh, sort of wrappers around building a specific project. And these are the projects that I have access to. Now, as an administrator, I have access to, actually, no, I, as an administrator, I don't have access to private projects. Uh, they haven't given me that. Uh, so I need to ask that. Uh, but these are all the projects that I have access to because I facilitate lots of harvesting projects and things like that. This is a very large list, um, uh, like very large, uh, just to give you an idea about what we're doing. These are the ones that are available or pending, not the ones that are completed. Um, that's odd. Yeah. Well, uh, anyways. Uh, Looks like you got some work to do. No, just kidding. Yeah, well, <laughs> there, there are, I, I'm not sure why they're not showing, oh, here, uh, maybe I just need to wait. So here are 193 times 10, so, you know, 2,000. Uh, completed projects. <coughs> it just took a while in order to go through the data. Yeah, there were so many, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and no one's going to have that problem except for me uh, because of uh, how we operate. So I just want to show you a, a similar project. I'm going to bring up this uh, project. This is something that we are supporting, which is a, uh, a, a Spanish healthcare OER uh, manual. And so basically Spanish uh, med medical Spanish uh, uh, resource. Um, and this is what the project looks like. Uh, and all projects look very similar, uh, near identical. And again, the, the key point off of a conductor instance is um, the capabilities in order to tie everything together. You could think of it, if you're familiar with wikis, we would call it a back page, but it's a back page for the overall project that you can go to and all that. It makes it easy uh, for OER uh, organizers in order to have communication with various uh, OER projects that they are facilitating on their respective campus or system, uh, but it provides a, a convenient mechanism in order for us to identify what people are doing, what they're doing. So anyways, this is the project that's out there. Um, uh, this is a construction project. Uh, we have some project properties here, which are relatively straightforward. Um, this is private. Um, so you guys can't find it, um, but if they were to switch it to public, you would be able to do a search and find it. Um, it's construction. Um, it looks like right now they're still at the training step of the timeline uh, and their resource is going to be stored in humanities library and we can even go to their uh, their project uh, as we're as we're doing here and, and i hope they're going to forgive me for showing what they're uh, they're they're doing so here's their their project of different forms that's there again it's it's under construction and i hope it'll be done this summer <clears throat> we have some source materials out here so if this happened to be a harvesting project. This would be where we where we got the project, and this is what we where we put it on our system, um, and some meta tags out there that you would expect in order to be able to search. So, no, we figured there are three primary criteria in order to be complete with the book. We have the construction uh, effort, we have a peer review effort, and then we have an accessibility review effort. Now, many books uh, fail to go through these two processes for a variety of reasons. Um, we view uh, every book as a transition or dynamic aspect that you want to be able to um, eventually get to this, this stage. So you can have notes that are uh, involved in here in terms of what the plans are that they are doing through, and you can build a team up. Um, so you can add the individual people that are on the team. 
Uh, some of them are leads, some are actually editors, some are liaisons, some are auditors uh, that have what you'd expect with those terms to be connected to. The key point is that this provides us a point instead of having emails going a variety of different sources to tie them together in order to be able to help build the project. Then we have communication threads where we can talk about various things like here's a 3D uh, animation application. This is one of what we're gonna be, one of our textbooks of the future model cases where we're gonna be building three-dimensional uh, anatomy uh, resources so you can come in and start to use it. So basically taking OpenStax two-dimensional static and make something far more powerful out there. So you can have a communication line uh, off of here and it, it's a thread that I can go back to or anyone else can go back to and, and get very quickly what's the state of affairs for this project, which is again, really great when we are organizing and facilitating them as a liaison, we wanna know what's going on with the state of affairs off of them. And then we have tasks uh, that we can establish and assign to various people with various dates that are, come, that, that are off of there. Um, and then we have the ability in order to view those tasks uh, as a Gantt uh, plot, if that's important, or as a uh, calendar view <coughs> with deadlines and such in order to be able to guide them. The key point is that we need to have better structure in order to be able to facilitate our projects and moving forward. And this right here was the tool uh, that we uh, felt was ideal for doing so. Um, so um, the timeline uh, instance uh, is meant in order to provide a roadmap uh, on how to build a book. Um, and there are various ways that go, people go about doing these things. And we try to be able to make this uh, in a generic fashion. And we're going to be expanding this in order to say, well, what are the steps that we feel are necessary in order to build a book in the order that they do it and guiding them uh, in the direction in order to do that within the LibreText platform uh, and, and that's out there. So it's, again, um, designed in order to be able to facilitate building within the LibreText platform, but you can ignore anything LibreText and do it also in one of the other platforms that's meaningful. So whether it's, you know, vision, accounts, training steps, scan, uh, you know, basically identifying what's out there, remixing construction and, and other things like that. Each one of these things can take time in order to do it. And that's what the LibreFest will go through and emphasize each of these aspects uh, in more detail. Or you can review them here, which go to our construction guide in order to be able to facilitate that. And I already showed you the Gantt plot and the organization that we have in order to be able to do that. Uh, this was a game changer in the way we operated um, because emails were not doing it and the other technologies were just not really optimized for doing it. But let me show you some of the other uh, aspects behind here. Um, I'm going to go to accessibility. Actually, let me go through peer review. Um, so each book has the ability in order to implement a peer review infrastructure. Uh, and that peer review infrastructure shows up in the, um, on the book. Uh, if they've implemented it. So if you want to grab this book right here, uh, you have the peer review infrastructure right here. Um, so you can come in, uh, and this is what I view as logging in, uh, in order to be able to do that. Um, I can implement when I do this thing. Um, that's not what I want. I want here. I can set up various rubrics out there. So if I want to grab the Affordable Learning uh, Georgia uh, rubric, you can do that, which is the one that I favor. If you prefer the Open Textbook Network rubric, which is a little bit more basic, you can go by doing that uh, or any other rubric, or you can build your own rubric. You can say, these are the things that you want to know from the community in order to do that. But again, what I emphasize here is that, you know, the book doesn't end at publishing, right? You need to constantly curate, constantly update and such that. And you can do that in a crowdsourced approach uh, without having to uh, force the original authors in order to be able to facilitate that. <clears throat> I will mention one other thing, which is a pet peeve that I have with um, uh, other reviews infrastructures is that reviews themselves have to be curated. So if you make a review that says that you need to fix something and you come in and you fix something, that review no longer has a utility. Uh, at least that component of that review. And it should be curated. It should be removed off of there because having an old review is just as bad as having an incorrect review associated with, uh, with something. Uh, and that is something I, uh, you guys stop, some people in the community have to stop thinking about reviews as a static repository of uh, things. So, um, so we have the ability in order to go in and the, the author or the it can can you know make a rebuttal and make a comment on the doing this and doing this and and engage in a conversation with the reviewer uh, and I think that that's great uh, because that again is part of the community uh, aspect in terms of OER and promoting uh, promoting OER, um, but um, this is this is the really cool thing that I'm, I'm very excited about. One of the biggest banes 
that's both legally and ethically required for us to be able to do is to handle accessibility. And it's not a bane necessarily, it's just, it's very complicated in order to make sure that your book handles appropriate accessibility requirements, whether it's ADA or WCAG um, or a handful of other uh, Title eight, Title eight, I can't remember which number that, that comes out there. You have a variety of different requirements off of there. And typically it takes someone who's well-trained in order to be able to evaluate uh, uh, the accessibility of a book in order to be able to do that. One of the nice things about accessibility is that if you formulate it uh, in a very specific manner, you can make it so well-trained students maybe you can see where I'm going here, can be able to evaluate uh, uh, books um, for OER and also to update books for, sorry, for accessibility purposes, uh, rather than having to go through an external um, uh, accessibility person that you may not have resources for doing so. Um, <clears throat> so that's part of the army off of here, but the infrastructure here is that every book that we have has this, this entry here, and this entry is a accessibility compliance review. It's called an ACR. And um, many people, many platforms have like a single page that kind of identifies accessibility requirements. But if you, uh, and they kind of have check marks that say everything is handled this and, and that. And that's, that's fine. But the real issue is that when you pay an external reviewer to come in in order to review uh, an accessibility, the accessibility aspects of a book. Um, first, you're paying a lot of money for it because they're well-trained. And the second one, they come in, at least the one we come in, it comes in with 81 criteria. Uh, in order to evaluate every single page. Uh, it's a very long time consuming process. So what we had, and forget about, and there's also in this a discussion guide, discussion thread that, that's here, but what we have here is a accessibility compliance review. So when we build the book on the Libre text, we can bring in the, all the pages in the book directly. Uh, and it creates it here, you can do it manually. And we have, and this is gonna be expanded, right now it's a shortened version. We'll have all 81 criteria that's out here. So you have 100 pages, you have 81 criteria, you have 810 criteria to evaluate for that book, each one, okay? Now, in the traditional way, someone comes in and they flip a switch. Yes, all alt texts have meaningful, all images have meaningful alt text on this page. Click it. And now you have a state of affairs so that when anyone else comes in to look at the state of your accessibility for your book, they know exactly this page has been reviewed for this section and it's 100% compliant, at least for that specific criteria. <coughs> um, so it becomes a, a, a compliance uh, re review. So if anyone says, well, I want to see the compliance review here, we give the, all the criteria for WCAG that's out there. Very extensive, uh, very painful in order to do that. But you can you can do it in parts because the key point for accessibility, and I don't want to transition on a long discussion of accessibility, is that there is no such thing as either cons uh, uh, accessible or not accessible. Actually, well, there's not accessible. It, it's, a, it's a spectrum. Uh, and it's various levels off of here. And this reflects that spectrum and gives you the ability to say, well, this is the state of affairs for this book, okay? And what do you need to do in order to update that book? Well, we need to fix this thing. We need to fix that thing that hasn't been evaluated. More importantly, within this army of students I talk about, I can train students in order to do this criterion very effectively. And they can go through this book and say, yes, I click this, click this, click this, and now you have a review infrastructure. Um, and you have a review infrastructure that's effective off of it. The second thing, which is gonna be released this summer, is that of the 81 criteria we have, you can break it up into three different categories <coughs> that can be written in three different uh, tables. Category, uh, uh, criteria that require human intervention to evaluate, like meaningful alt text, Criteria that you can use a bot, a computer in order to evaluate, like are alt text below 150 characters. And criteria that's connected to uh, the, the platform itself, not the actual content on the platform. The latter two uh, it is standardized by our review of the platform and a bot that comes in. So the intent is to make this thing as automated as possible. So it's, you can come in, you click a button and it will do the review of your book for these various criteria that comes out there. And I think this is really cool I, 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 because it's exhaustive, it's proper, uh, it, it covers all of the check marks that you need in order to be able to do a good 
great job, let's say, uh, for accessibility. And it provides a centralized mechanism. You can always go back and learn how you can improve the book as we come in um, you know, for accessibility. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, like I mentioned, it gets these uh, these pages directly from the LibreText uh, site. But if you're doing this on Pressbooks or something, you'd have to manually add it in because we don't have uh, the infrastructure for importing Pressbooks and we probably never will uh, within this infrastructure. Um, although it's all open source, so anyone can grab this from our GitHub repository and customize it for whatever the uh, purposes that we have. Okay, so um, I'm, I'll mention a few other things on the side here. Uh, uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> I can come in and build an alert and say, I want to create alert on anything dealing with calculus uh, uh, in the, the book level. Uh, and now when someone submits a, a book that has calculus uh, that's connected to a keyword author like that, I'm going to get a notification. So if I, if I have a specific topic, I want to know if something's come in, this is the way you go about uh, uh, doing that. I'm going to trash that. Um, uh, I mentioned harvest requests. This is the request that we have when people request a, a harvest, uh, knowing their priority, what book they want to come in, where we go through, and then we hand them off to our students. They become projects when we actually approve them. Um, uh, we can. This is how we request accounts for our sites and adoption reports. Uh, uh, so this is the key aspect for evaluating the impact of an OER platform. I'm uh, sorry, an OER uh, book. Um, is who's adopting it and where. And because we don't have a single constituency, we're not a UC Davis project. We're a global project out there. Uh, and we don't have any mechanism in order to throttle down to find out who's adopting our books. Now, yeah, I know that we have 700,000 pages of content and that six and a half millennia of reading. So I know lots and lots of people are using our books in a variety of different sources, but people want uh, funding agencies or other purposes to know who's using your book and what's the impact off of here. And then we have this adopt uh, report infrastructure that people come in and then uh, it, campuses uh, that have their own thinking can look at their adoption reports to find out who's adopting what and where um, as a centralized mechanism in order to move it forward. Um, and we also facilitate that uh, as, a, as approach forward. So we're very excited about that. And again, these are the last three books off of here. Uh, projects don't have to be textbooks. Uh, we organize these in a variety of different things. Like I, these are building uh, questions uh, or solutions to problems in the Brown and LeMay text map that we have for chemistry um, because we have the problems, but we don't have the solutions. And I have students that are building across the board here um, and such. So uh, <clears throat> I, um, I'm at the end uh, of, a dis I think I discussed everything that's associated with this thing. You have access to uh, to the commons. Um, if you're on a campus and you want to join the LibreNet, uh, uh, please send me an email. Um, you can go to, uh, you can see other people's uh, 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 campus instances here uh, and such. And, and this has saved uh, many, 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 many uh, hours of time uh, in, the, in organizing things at, at scale, but it's also convenient in order to not have to dork around with uh, emails um, that's out there. Everything's centralized and we can go to it and such like that. We found it to be beautiful uh, off of there. Yeah. And this is one of the examples, like I mentioned before, that, this, that it wasn't a brainchild of, of of my brain, um, I'd like to claim credit. It was a student that actually created this and came to me and said, you need this. Uh, and we uh, said, yes, optimized it. And now it's it's there for the general community in order to use. So uh, I will end with that. Uh, I can I can show any other aspect of the, um, the Libreverse if people are interested, whether it happens to be with the homework system or editing or, um, um, or even the, the analytics, although I can't show the analytics because they show uh, student names uh, and I don't have a FERPA button on it like I have for the other system for doing it. But uh, I, the analytics are pretty pretty cool to see how your book is being used uh, that's out there constructively, so. Sure, uh, hey, well, that, thanks that, you know, I learned so much today. I, you, I haven't looked at LibreText closely for a while and there's so much going on there. The, um, I mean, the depth to which you guys have built tools to help with you know, the construction and evaluation of, you know, effective OER is, is it's impressive. There's, there's so much going on there. Um, I think that the sort of project management aspects of it are really, really robust as well as the, like the accessibility review and so forth. Um, you know, one of our um, most active participants here has been Danielle. 
uh, and they've actually got <clears throat> quite a few questions <laughs> up. And I actually even wondered, Danielle, do you want to come on on mic and ask, or do you want me to ask for you? Uh, sure, I can ask. Uh, I'll I'll wait till the very end if there's time for that that question about the computation. But uh, sure. Regarding um, da, 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 oh yeah, scanning. So I'm aware of two types of 3D scanning. One is for scanning the environment. One is for scanning objects. Uh, does this platform allow to place those files for free here? Sure. And and what kind of files are allowed? Um, real files. Uh, I mean, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's a database, so we can store any files that's there. As long as it's not like a, 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 a I think we exclude any executable code because that may have bad issues. But if it's just basically the data set, yeah, we just throw it into our database and we can we can share it. We do that for ancillary materials and things like that. Um, and we're, uh, uh, I mean, we can add to any page, and no matter what, as long as it doesn't exceed like a 500 megabyte file type of thing um and, and that we would then do something else in order to do it but we would um our intent is that this um commons would provide a convenient mechanism for ancillary materials that uh, are files like that so you can come in and say okay well what are the you know we, we have an option and what's the homework for this book uh, uh, or that's provided or here are some ancillary materials here are some powerpoints or here are um and the other things uh, we haven't tweaked that up here um but it's a minor issue in order to do um so um yeah the three files of of what may i ask um it, it's for education of the trades so it's um heavy equipment uh different types of engines uh in, in some cases it's ropes different types of ropes for you know, pulling and lifting materials. Um, so it can be large 3D objects or it can be smaller ones like tools. So um, <clears throat> I mentioned uh, 3D within the context of, uh, um, uh, what I'm the, the anatomy stuff, which I'm very excited. So I, I, I really love 3D uh, capabilities, um, and, but from an accessibility perspective, it's a nightmare. <coughs> um, you know, one of the team that's focusing on this uh, has been building uh, a web-based infrastructure like, you know, Sketchfab or whatever, that we're able to then show that, that raw uh, on our platform, not just basically being able to host the files that you can then uh, load up. Um, and also do the same thing with uh, enhanced uh, reality instead of a virtual reality. Or you know, they want to do things on virtual reality, um, play with enhanced reality, and then, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, 2D version of the of the 3D stuff, so it's mouse interaction and things like that. Um, and I don't know what the state of affairs off of that, but storing it not a problem. Making it embeddable in order to be able to play with it, we're on our way there. I just don't know what the state of affairs is with that. Okay, with uh, the software that we were using, the uh, the software itself allows for integration of things like. Uh, uh, you know, you have your object, you can label different parts, A, B, C, D, or you can put whole paragraphs in, in text boxes associated with different parts. Yeah. So that could help. And then what would be nice is to pair that with questioning. So the student can rotate the object, find the information, and then answer a question maybe by filling a table to compare maybe two different parts or and maybe they answer comprehension questions. And this is a, this is a, um, an institution where a lot of the learning objectives are at a low scale, like remembering and understanding. But you know, if you bring in analysis and comparison, that would be nice too. So that's the kind of interaction that, that I'm looking at for, for this stuff. So it's, yeah, part of the question was about, yeah, does your platform store it? So I guess, yes. And then, yeah, the other question that you, you've sort of brought up to is, um, uh, how to, you know, the pedagogical axis, how do you bring in all the interaction uh, so that the scans are being used and they're not just there to display information? Yeah, I mean, that, that latter aspect is, uh, is an issue for the subject matter expert in order to evaluate what's the best use off of these things. And unfortunately, while we like to think that you know, the web is what, 25 years old, um, that 
that we mastered it. Let's say the modern distribution of the web. And Nate's going to start talking about Xerox uh, 25 years earlier or something. But um, the, uh, the I think that that's a, a matter that decide that that needs to be evaluated on an object by object basis. Um, that's that's there. Um, the and the reality is, I think we just don't know in many cases what's the best way in order to do things. Uh, so it, I, I like that you are emphasizing that you need to put some thinking behind this. It's not just basically here it is, and then the students are going to naturally learn more, which is not entirely the case. You need to use it constructively. But I, I would like to uh, step back a little bit in terms of what you said before that, which is um, taking these three-dimensional objects and combining them with some sort of assessment whether it's formative or uh, summative. Um, and the nice thing about the ADAPT homework system, and uh, I need to pull it up, is the ADAPT homework system it allows the building of what I call Frankensteins. Yeah. So the ADAPT homework system lets us embed executable, sorry, embed, I went to the wrong tag, lets us use auto grading technology, whether it's H5P, which is actually not a very good technology for summative use. In fact, it's a really crappy technology for summative use. Uh, or something more powerful, like web work and MyOpenMath or some native QTI-based stuff. And we can then add on top of it some uh, preamble, um, what we call source. So we could take any sort of JavaScript uh, or embeddable code at the top and add below a question-based infrastructure. So I could take a FET simulation, pop it at the top, and then ask any question down below. And now it becomes uh, a, um, uh, a, an interactive question infrastructure. Or you can say, you can give them three-dimensional capabilities where they need to move it around, uh, and then you ask them questions about uh, what, they're, uh, what they get from the three-dimensional aspects. Um, that's native with the way we organized our ADAPT homework system. Um, because it's designed to be very flexible as open-ended questions, as auto-graded questions, as different technologies that come in, because no one technology is suitable across the board, um, which also means that ADAPT is exceedingly complicated, but it's super powerful. Um, and at the growth, that, the rate that we're growing here, everybody's going to know about it, and there's no reason not to be able to use it. Um, so we can do that. Um, my issue is not whether we can do that, it's again gets back to this accessibility purposes uh, with three dimensional capabilities. Um, and, you know, in many cases, I don't know. It's difficult in order to have an accessibility component to three dimensional things. Now, now you can do a simple uh, accommodation where you can give the three dimensional file that can be printed up. Um, so that on individual campuses, they can print up the file in 3D printer, and then uh, visually impaired students can uh, use tactile uh, interactions in order to be able to do it. But, you know, in some cases, like with anatomy, we have a hard time doing that where, how do you tell with what's a vein and what's a uh, artery? Well, typically we use colors in order to be able to distinguish that. Um, there are some limitations in terms of being able to use different type of polymers in order to be able to feel different things. But at some point, uh, and and I, I just can't figure out what would be a, a comparable solution in order to handle those things. And that's one of the issues that I have uh, with uh, uh, with using these three Ds. So if everyone is enabled, uh, no no not not disabled, um, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. But we have to be uh, universal in the way we view things, both legally and ethically, uh, in order to do that. So um, I see a bunch of questions about H five P. Should I address that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's a bunch, but some. <laughs> Just wondering is that if H5P is supported in, in LibreText. Yeah, I mean, H5P is embeddable, so you can embed it formatively and, and summatively. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll compare it to uh, Pressbooks. So, it, it, well, let me first, H5P, um, is a really peculiar technology. Uh, so it, it's not just here's a JavaScript uh, instance that you can then embed wherever you want, like a little code off of that. It, it it's it's a Node.js infrastructure that you need to have some 
infrastructure behind it. And there are only about 10 platforms that use it natively. Press, WordPress is one of them. And then Pressbooks, because there's based off of WordPress, they, they get it for free. Uh, and then they're running with that. Other platforms that uh, don't have it running native, uh, which are lots of them, uh, uh, then have to rely on an external source that they embed into it, which is perfectly fine as iframing or other approaches in order to do it. Iframing is probably it. So our approach in order to do that is in, um, Pressbooks has an instance where they embed their H5P into every book. Um, so when you have a, a book, you can do that, but that favors uh, the fragmentation aspect. So if you have three different people who have updated their H5P instance, uh, then who benefits? How do you know what's been updated here and there? You need a central repository to do that. Well, um, this is what we have, which is the studio or the Libra Studio. Um, uh, and the Libra Studio is a Drupal-based technology, which is one of the technologies that hosts H5P. This is uh, constructed by uh, Yasin Dai at um, uh, up in uh, Canada. Um, uh, and uh, it hosts about... Uh, Actually, this number is not correct. It's about 10,000 problems of openly published uh, things. So um, it, these are contributed and harvested uh, out there. You can build it. You can get it freely available. Um, I'm going to type in a access code um, that's in here, uh, which is fine. Anyone can grab it. Um, and you can create your own H5P. You don't need to pay anybody for doing it because it can cost money. Uh, uh, and uh, you can embed these things into pages formatively which means that you don't know who solved the problems. Uh, you can embed them into pages on the LibreText through ADAPT, and then it gets coupled to uh, summative use. There's two caveats here that unfortunately are oftentimes brushed underneath the rug for people who, are, who believe H5P is the savior to, uh, to homework. The problem is that A, the, the vast majority of the H5P problems are actually not um, uh, accessible. Uh, and I'm, gonna, I'm not just talking about the accessibility that uh, Jubal uh, creates off of there. When we do our own external accessibility reports off of here, and this one doesn't have it, uh, uh, this, this type here, uh, uh, there are only like five of them that are accessible. Um, so uh, did it not work? I'm looking for the criteria that's maybe- On the, uh, on the fly demo. Oh, yeah, it's like uh, uh, checking off of here. The, um, so we went through the books. Uh, I'm wondering if it was modified and, and lost. Um, so we have a criteria that evaluates our assessments as either green, yellow, or red uh, for accessibility purposes. Uh, and it tells you, well, what you need to do in order to be able to use them productively. So even if you do use them, you have to write them in a very specific manner to handle accessibility. And that's all written into our construction manuals. You can see a guide in terms of telling you exactly how to go about doing it. But what's more important is even if you create these things in an accessible manner, um, they will never be secure because they're client side technology, which means as a student, I can get a problem even if I have a grade book behind, even if it happens to be connected directly to a learning management system or it goes through press books or if it uses our, our system, you uh, a student can turn off the internet, get the answer, and turn on the internet, and then submit the answer. And there are two several other hacks that you can do in order to be able to, because it's client side, it's insecure technology. Um, so, um, and this is the issue I have with the people who are pushing H5P as the savior for, for these sort of things. It is really awful because if I'm an instructor and I build a whole bunch of H5P exercises meant to be homework and I discover the students can hack into it really easily um, and they will discover it, hands down, they will discover it, uh, then basically all my work is trash. Formative. Good. Some yeah, I was going to say, like, there's still, it could be a powerful formative tool. Right? It's, it's exceedingly powerful formative. But homework is what I'm talking about. Summative, yeah. no. Uh, you can do it low stakes summative, but definitely don't do high stakes summative. Yeah. The well, exception uh, that we do. I'll make yeah. a plug for the ungrading track here at MyFest so we can just move away from high stakes. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> the dogs didn't like that mention of ungrading. <laughs> <laughs> that was a trigger word for your dog. Yeah, she's annoying. Uh, so you were saying uh, ungrading? 
Oh yeah, just um, I, there's an ungrading track going on here at my fest as well. Um, and I was just, I'm, I mean, I'm making a joke a little bit, but you know, high stakes summative assessment. When I understand, of course, especially in STEM, it's it's not something that one can just cast aside. But uh, you know, there are there are ways to move beyond high stakes machine gradable summative assessment. Definitely, uh, that's a different and, conversation. And there's, a, there's a lot. There's a lot behind that, um, and, and I know the people who are who are pushing it. Um, I haven't done the transition uh, into that 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 approach for doing things. I'm not saying it's bad or anything. Sure. Um, well, and, it's and, hard with 500 students, you know. Right. Well, I mean, if you build so the adapt system, uh, which again I didn't go over, uh, has various modes of uh, of operation. Um, and the intent is if you want to use it in a mastery approach, you can do this. If you want to use it in a, um, uh, a spec grading approach, you can do that. If you want to use it in adaptive learning, you can do that. So we're not wedded to one approach off of that. Uh, and ungrading maybe, could be um, just as easily. You can, you, you can uh, flip a switch and then you're essentially being able to track their progress as long as you have everything indicated in terms of learning objectives and things which is right. necessary for adaptive learning and you know, I'll, men I'll mention to the ungrading folks about that and um you know maybe that would be that might be an opportunity to actually mm -hmm. just delve in deeper just into that you know the yeah. assessment capabilities um mm -hmm. in LibreText if you're interested yeah so we do use h5p for the clickers so h5 so uh, adapt um uh it can be used for in-class clickers or, or personal response uh, infrastructure. So you don't need to pay $25 per term um, per student uh, for accessing this. Uh, and then it wires directly into the grade book and that uh, goes- And they just use it. mobile devices or- Yeah. Got it. Use mo mobile devices. Uh, we will have an app at the end of this year, but they've wow. already started building it uh, in both um, phones and tablets on both, um, both platforms. Um, so you can come in and you'll, you can just, use the app and it's going to be uh, designing it so it's anonymous so in other words i can also use it in uh, presentations like a big presentation where everyone just come in and just use it so we can actually don't need to couple it to a grade book we can actually um, make it as just a generic thing and there's lots of these technologies out there the key point is that we're not charging for it it comes naturally with using adapt and it's uh, out there so we're very excited about that prospect but h5p is useful for that so while you can still hack into it in h5p uh, in the same way i talked about out. Um, if you give it one minute, give students one minute in order to be able to give the answer and submit it, uh, it becomes less likely of an issue. And then if it's a, uh, so you can even make it pseudo high stakes um, and uh, pit work. But then again, we also have the other technologies in ADAPT, the web work and my open math or IMath AS and the, the, the native technologies, which handles the accessibility and the security aspects uh, well, but then they don't have the graphical visual aspects that H5P has. So again, no one technology handles everything that you want off of here. And that's why ADAPT sits on top of all of these technologies in order to make it so that it's exceedingly powerful across the board. And that's the reason why it's taken, I mean, uh, it was part of our grant that uh, was a, um, originally three year grant and we're at three and a half years and uh, it's but you know anyone could get access to adapt so if you have a question go to adapt.libertix.org and i can go uh, i can discuss that in more detail so great well we're actually running out of time today but wow um so much i can see why you know you, you talk about needing more time to do a full tour um so much great stuff here i really really appreciate um the depth that you did go into because i just i learned a ton of stuff that i didn't know and i'm sure everybody else did as well so, um, like I said, here's my email, which I think I put on there, but uh, I will add it there. It's pretty hard to, uh, to forget. It's delmartlibertix.org. Um, there's probably only one Delmar um, in chemistry in the world. Uh, so if you just Google Delmar and um, chemistry and you ignore any critical comments from rate my professor, then everything <laughs> will be perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, Danielle has, has already promised to contact you um, to delve into some more deeper, deeper topics. So that's great. Sounds well, great. I, I really do appreciate it. And I know that you, uh, everybody probably has things they need to go to, but we've reached the bottom of the hour as we, as we call it for people who still use analog clocks. And that's when we're supposed to sign off. Do you have any parting words for us? Delmar? Rock on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Let's keep on keeping on. Everybody stay safe out there. Um, uh, and I hope that your uh, your cough gets better.
Yeah, well, it's getting better every day. Um, Excellent. So, uh, so with that, uh, enjoy uh, whatever day, wherever you happen to be. Thank you so much, Delmar, and everybody who attended.